Hello and welcome to Exploring Global Problems. In this podcast, we talk to academics from Swansea University whose groundbreaking research is tackling global challenges from health innovation to sustainable futures and the environment, from digital technologies to clean energy. My name is Eileen Rees and with me today is Dr Miriam Ellen jones lecturer in the Welsh language in Swansea University since 2021, Miriam. Now, Miriam's research is to do with science fiction, something quite close to my heart as it happens because I'm an avid fan of Star Trek. Miriam graduated in Welsh film and television from Aberystwyth University and went on to research for an MPhil and then a PhD in science fiction. And in particular, science fiction in the Welsh language. So, welcome, Miriam. Thank you for joining us on Exploring Global Problems. I've been looking forward to this conversation, largely because of my love of Star Trek, which started when I was a child. So how did you get interested in science fiction? Well, it's odd. People expect me to say, also say, you know, I loved science fiction from from when I was this high but actually it was when I was a little older that I started discovering sort of and trying to look for literature that sort of took me somewhere else. I'm from a very rural area and I suppose as a teenager I rebelled a little bit and I wanted to be anywhere but um, the little village I'm from. You weren't in the young farmers then? (laughs) No I wasn't unfortunately. (laughs) I don't think I'd have much welcome with my black nail varnish at the time Um, but I loved films like Back to the Future which is not hard science fiction at all. It's quite a sort of gateway into science fiction almost and time travel narratives. And it was when I was at university and looking for a dissertation topic that I thought, well, what about looking for something that I feel isn't here in Welsh? Um, And at the time, science fiction sort of fell into place in a way. And I also had um, a close friend at university who was like, I don't read Welsh language literature at all. It's all boring. And that's a narrative we hear quite a lot of from teenagers and young people especially. And I remember making a mission one term to find him a book he would read and enjoy. And I did. It was sort of a thriller with a scientist as its sort of protagonist. It was called Tyre Olan Revn by Daniel Davis. And he loved it. And he was like, you've got to find more of this. So what was that about? Um, it was about, if I remember correctly, something or someone was kidnapped. It was like this new scientific formula and the the protagonist had to look and find, you know, the person who'd taken it. And there was a series of clues by his colleague that were all sort of based on the periodic table and things like that. And although not really science fiction, it was sort of borderline. It did make me think, well, is there any more science fiction? Could I find other novels? So how did you have to persuade um, your tutors to let you study science fiction in Welsh? I was really, really lucky of my timing in Aberystwyth because the author, the postmodernist author, Mihangel Morgan, was there at the time and he was my creative writing lecturer. And he, from the first day, loved the idea. He was so enthusiastic and it made me really believe in the subject as well because I have faced people who've gone, Welsh language science fiction, does that exist? Um, But Mihangel Morgan, from the first, you know, from from day dot was just like oh my gosh yes there's so much scope to this what will you find have you seen this have you seen that and it sort of grew from there really and yeah I've been really lucky. So I'm gonna actually say that how much stuff is there in the Welsh language because I'm actually quite surprised that there's a lot of it because it's not out there in the public domain that there are many books on science fiction in the Welsh language. No, not really, is it? Um, I've got a list of about 60 to 70 oh, wow. um, examples of novels and short stories mainly. The first um, example I can remember is um, by Ceiriog, who's actually better known as a poet and quite a romantic poet. But he wrote this sort of fictional um, correspondence from a character who'd gone to the moon. Oh, this wow. character called Samirig Grunsuth which is a lovely fancy name. Um, But he had gone to the moon and said, I've had enough of of planet Earth. You're all horrible. And I'm sitting here looking at you and judging what you're doing. And he was, and he would criticise people. So when was that written? um, About eight, in the 1850s. Well before there was any talk of anybody getting onto the world. Yeah, massively. But obviously the first modern novel would be Istelum Fogelis' Oithnos and Cymru But you do have 
examples for children and by Tegla Davis. Well, coming back to Uthnos and Hamrivith, um, a week in Wales of the future, I suppose you'd roughly translate that as. It was actually the book that I studied for my O-levels, as they were in those days, um, GCSEs now. Um, but th- I found that an incredibly good book. I mean, basically, it's got two scenarios. A guy travels to the future where people only speak Welsh in Wales and then travels to, wants to go back there um, and finds that nobody does. So what 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 are your opinions of Wyth Nossingham Vivi? It's such an interesting starting point or an official starting point then, because it is the most sort of, when I do speak about my research, Wyth Nossingham Vivi is usually the one that people can name straight off the bat. And that contrasting image, but although a lot of people will say the dystopian image is far more interesting, and in that dystopian image, we have the Welsh language literally dying with the last native speaker, an old lady. And that's become sort of a mythology. And it's a symbol that often sort of comes back in later Welsh language science fiction. That old lady is a very big symbol for language and language death. But what's quite interesting is people sort of dismiss the utopia as very boring. But utopias often are boring because... Stories arise from conflict. Indeed. You want people arguing. And jeopardy. And, yeah, and danger. And although Islam Folk Ellis try to interject these sort of people who didn't agree with the system and the utopian way of life in the free whales depicted in the novel, um, it wasn't quite enough. It wasn't quite exciting enough. But it it's it's an image that looks at so many different aspects of Welsh culture and the possibilities. So, for instance, there's a chapter where Ivan, the protagonist, visits farms in North Wales. There's another one where he visits a chapel which is sort of non-conformist and it fits all sectors and all religion. And there's so many... He also visits the National Theatre. And obviously in that time, there wasn't a National Theatre for Wales. That's something that came later. But it was sort of discussed in the novel. Um, but it's quite interesting. It's also quite um, nostalgic in tone. Um, the National Theatre is a traditional play and they visit a traditional restaurant, which is actually described as being like something from St Fagans, oh. even though it's a future. So as a blueprint, it was quite interesting in the way that it sort of still stuck quite heavily in the past, um, but tried to sort of dip its toe into the future as well. Hasn't that been one of our issues, though, in Wales, about how we've... We kind of obsess about our past, don't we? You know, we're, we're, we're very big on looking at the history and our princes and how hard done by we are. Do, do you think that there is a place in Welsh language science fiction, although it's an utopia, to, to actually make the language normal and an irregular thing as opposed to it being a minority and a little bit to one side. Yeah, there is a scope for that. No one apart from Uthnos and Henry Vith. And even then, it was more of an acceptance of the Welsh language that people could speak it and it was no big deal, to, mm. so to say. There is a far more pessimistic tone. Um, and I think of a Dydd Olaf, so The Last Day by Owain Owain, which was published in 1976. And that discusses technology and this sort of failed plot to sort of unite every minority culture and uh, community in the world as one large majority. But obviously that backfires because you lose that minority sort of voice and that perspective. But what's quite interesting about that novel is that the doc it's presented as an archive, as documents. And those documents only survive because they were written in Welsh. The computer didn't understand. <laughs> so there's always that sort of tension, perhaps. And when the Welsh language does prevail, it's because global technologies or mod, you know, modern way of life can't deal with minority language. And but like, that, that yeah. isn't the case. That that is the case, though, isn't it? When you think about, you know, uh, the use of Alexa or, or the GPS and your and your car. Um, how are we as a language going to survive if we cannot enter into that world? And oh my gosh, not just surviving, but also thriving in a way. Yeah. I don't know, a lot of language speakers discuss that they often get left and right mixed up. As a native <laughs> Welsh speaker, I hear left and right and I have to think really hard. So that element of it 
is quite confusing. <laughs> Could be dangerous with the uh, <laughs> sat nav. GPS. But I always, when I go to international conferences, and I've been really lucky to be able to go, I've, I've been to Norway, Poland, and the interest in Welsh language science fiction and my research. I, but I always start with the idea that I can't actually greet my Alexa in my mother tongue at home. Um, and sometimes I do accidentally say diolch instead of thank you to her. Or and it, she ignores it, you. And she ignores me. <laughs> she says, oh, I'm sorry, I don't understand, yeah. which we laugh. <laughs> but actually, it's a big part of our lives. And why can't I say, well, Alexa, can you go like that? Do you think that people are addressing that? I think people are starting to maybe comprehend that a bit more yes and I'll return to Adi Dhorlav as an example in its time it was largely forgotten it was discussing artificial intelligence which is not as a part of you know today it's such a part of our conversation day to day we're now considering what implications that has for academic integrity for example but in 1970s it was very much a specialist subject it wouldn't have been something that most people would have discussed over the dinner table, so no. to say. But today it's far more normalised and people were re- are ready now to hear it. And in 2014, Gwenna Saunders released an album based on that book and brought it to a new audience and it's now been republished and people are perhaps thinking more about this. And I know technology um, conferences like Hackyeith, for instance, we are discussing you know, our relationship with technology and what sort of implications does the... F- does its lack of knowledge of minority languages have, you know? And I th- I suppose, you know, you've, you've talked about the number of books that you came across, having decided to do this PhD. And it's quite a few, but I didn't know there were that many. And you kind of think, is this a genre that is only exists because people competed a steadfords to win prizes? Because many of the ones you've named, you know, got to the four because they won uh, the Medal Rydiaeth in, in the in the Eisteddfod. Is there a marketplace out there for people to actually purchase? Is there a way of making a living by writing science fiction in Welsh? That's perhaps an interesting question when I'm not sure I'm equipped to answer whether making a living. Um, but the Eisteddfod, actually, a lot of um, adjudicators and uh, academic critic, um, ri- literary critics even, actually question they're like oh well I'm not a fan of science fiction usually even to the ones that have won a competition in the Eisteddfod so I don't think it's always an an idea of going right I've got science fiction I'm sending it to the Eisteddfod if anything the Eisteddfod as an institution or could I be careful how I say this (laughs) um, perhaps people's ideals of literary merit to win prizes in the Eisteddfod so the it, it it it's almost a matter of luck as well, which three judges will you have Indeed. on a day? But I wouldn't say people maybe compete with that in mind. But yes, yeah, some have definitely risen to win these prizes. I'm thinking of Caflogion in 1979, Atiheyan, so um, the Steel House in 1984, 1992, Seren Wenner, which is a borderline That's science a Robin fiction Schoen fantasy. Schoen book, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, Robin well, Schoen. Um, and then you've hit on something there, which I think is an issue that a lot of people possibly wonder about, which is what is the definition of science fiction? And so you've got science fiction and you've got fantasy they are different? Do they meld? Or what is your view? Science fiction is far more rooted in realist fiction. And people are always surprised to sort of hear that. What do you mean by realist fiction, though? Fiction that maybe depicts the world around us, so or the world we're familiar with. Right. Fantasy tends to go to the unfamiliar and to the furthest realms of the imagination, to what you never think is possible. But science fiction is sort of in between in a strange way. And I tend to always refer to Samuel L. Delaney's um, uh, definition. And he uses events that could happen um, as the crux of a science fiction story. So Star Trek, Mm -hmm. even though it's based on planets that we've never heard of, so they are places that are remote and, and imaginary, but there is a likelihood that the science in Star Trek is possibly going to be real in the future. Exactly. Because they try to base it as scientifically real as they can. So that is science fiction, not fantasy, right? Yes, Yeah. definitely. Okay. So what's quite interesting is that idea that it's possible, but it's also a little bit maybe 
unlikely. Right. And um, Marvel films, would you say that those were science fiction? Fantasy, because if you oh, think see, of I that, think super fire, superpowers, yeah. but they could be a bit of both. You do have the mad scientist sometimes, don't you, in that image? Yeah. And, and Iron Man is all perhaps, technology, actually. yes. Yeah. yeah, Iron Man actually yeah. is a good idea. Yeah. Oh, I didn't think of that there before. But yeah, it's quite I hope interesting. I see that in your thesis. <laughs> yeah. It's quite interesting when you refer back to Star Trek especially and you think of those original series. The flip phone, for instance, the video calls are things we actually take for granted today. They are. Yeah. And, and you wonder to what extent they influence scientific research, um, the, the, the actual, you know, the, the imagination of the, the script writers um, and the scientific advisors that they had and how technology yeah. moving forward is actually thinking, oh, that was quite a good idea. We'll go with that one. And it's always quite interesting, especially in a Welsh language context. People often fear that word science. People think, oh, science is, you know, I don't know, especially I think of my experience in school of science. It's something difficult. I don't understand that. Oh, don't get me started. Um, I, I know. really worry about that. Yeah. And my physics teacher, if he remembers me, will always think, oh my gosh, she's discussing science. But I always hasten to add no science fiction. <laughs> um, but it's quite interesting that block sometimes we have. But science fiction doesn't always have to be scientific. It can be a sociological change, an economic change, a political change, or to consider that aspect of things. I don't consider Margaret Atwood's A Handmaid's Tale um, particularly scientific, but it is science fiction. And perhaps the label of speculative fiction perhaps is better suited, the idea that we're speculating of what comes next. And science fiction is always rooted in today. Although you think it might be prophesizing something, it's not actually saying much about tomorrow. It's warning you about what's happening today or perhaps discussing what's happening today, if not warning. Yeah, basically, they're just stories about people's lives, aren't they? Yeah. Um, but but they, are, they are trying to aim it for the future. Yeah. Yeah. So, OK, you said something really interesting there about, OK, that in Wales, maybe, or in the Welsh language... Possibly science has yet to become, I don't know, in common parlance. And and I, I find it really frustrating trying to make programmes in the Welsh language on science um, because there is this kind of thing, oh, no, I I'm not going to understand that because the terminology is going to be um, too difficult. And it's so annoying because the terminology is difficult in English as well. It's just that you use it and therefore you become accustomed to it. So what about, is terminology a, a, a hurdle that science fiction writers have to overcome? It certainly could be, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think, for instance, in Welsh, there was no actual consensus to what was an alien. Now, an alien in English, you have that clear image of what it is. You've got either a little green man or a tall, thin silver man, don't you? Or I'm being, always maybe a man. not always a man, <laughs> but a being. Woman, <laughs> um, but this sort of image, you, yeah. you, you, you've got something that comes to mind straight away when you think of alien. But in Welsh, trying to think of a sort of a, a, a term that would suit and create that image, I actually created a new term because I'd seen someone try and sort of Welshify the word alien by changing the spelling, which just looked horrendous and oh, just, yeah. it didn't even, it didn't validate the term in Welsh either. A lot of people use the word estroniaid as well, which also means foreigners, which presents a, a very uncomfortable um, um, translation then. So I um, use the word arallfydwyr, which means otherworldly people, um, which I think better represents that science fiction image of an alien um, but that was a certain hurdle and obviously an acronym for UFO is something yeah. we know without even thinking what a UFO is and we all have that specific image in mind. Gosh I'm trying but to think of an equivalent in Welsh now. It's, um, they're, they're, again no direct consensus and with science fiction in the Welsh language there isn't really a sort of benchmark science fiction author either people tend to dabble with it so to say so someone would maybe think, okay, I've not tried science fiction or, or the Welsh language needs a science fiction book. Istan Fok Ellis and Eirig Wynne later in the 90s were, were prominent with thinking about this. And it seems no one's really thought, okay, I'll look for other science fiction books. They were like, I'll, I'll, I'll base my Welsh science fiction or maybe an English model or something else. Istan Fok Ellis, for instance, his novels have a lot of HG Wells in them. 
And that's what he would write, read as a child, as you said, in his essays. So it's quite interesting, maybe that lack of consensus as to what people are using. But Irian William did try and actually publish a, a sort of a list of Welsh language yes. science fiction terms. But whether people saw it or used them well, is another thing. Well, that's the trouble, isn't it? Mm. That is the problem. But I'm sure that your work, possibly... You know, if it gets a little bit more publicity, we'll we'll bring that out uh, in, into the fore. But a lot of science fiction is also, also post-apocalyptic, isn't it? You know, you've had this massive, um, you know, it's the end of the world, it's been the nuclear uh, event has happened and they they talk about life after that. I, are there examples of that in the Welsh language? In Welsh, yes. And before I maybe talk about the examples, post-apocalyptic fiction is quite interesting in the way that it's sometimes not considered science fiction, even though it's looking at tomorrow. And it's usually something that's man-made, that's created a nuclear disaster or an apocalyptic disaster, for instance. And one that's come to the fore recently is Llyfr Glas um, yes. by Manon Stefan Ross. Yes, Llyfr Glas um, Nebo, you, uh, it has been translated, yeah, has the it? the Blue Book of Nebo, yes. Yes. Um, I think it's up for a prize as well, the English oh, version, right. the translation. And what is the story of that book? Because it's, it's a beautiful book. It is. And a lot of people don't acknowledge it as science fiction, which is quite interesting, even though Manon Stefan Ross herself cites John Wyndham as a big influence. Um, a prominent British science fiction writer as well. It's about a, a woman um, and her son surviving post in a very rural setting after an apocalyptic nuclear disaster. But they see it as a safe space. Everything that's happened to them previously before what they call a tervin, so the end, um, they found quite negative aspects of modern life. You know, they were glued to screens, they never read or they were judged or everything. And then suddenly they're in this safe haven where they've got a library of Welsh books and everything's quite idyllic and things are thriving and growing and there's a future. So post-apocalyptic disasters, especially in a Welsh language context, is actually a new beginning and a way to all of a sudden be a majority, <laughs> a culture that is thriving and not a minority culture, which is quite interesting in a way. Do you think that? That is why these writers choose that, because what they're trying to do, they're almost political books, they're almost language activism books, because they are creating the kind of whales that they would like to, to, to live in. And that is the only way they can do that is by making it post-apocalyptic and starting from scratch. Yep. It's a total blank page. Yeah. Um, and of course, writing in Welsh anyway is a political act it's not you're never going to have your new york times bestseller with a welsh language novel or maybe i don't know we might we might see that ha you know in a science fiction book it might happen <laughs> um with translation aids or but um no you it is always a political act and i think welsh culture is very aware because it's a minority culture of having to struggle of having to survive of perhaps the future of the language. It's something people openly discuss and it's been a big part of the Welsh language and Welsh past. So it does lend itself naturally to science fiction and it's almost a wonder that there's, you know, More, we're not only yeah. writing science yes. fiction almost yeah. because we are always imagining those scenarios. We're like, well, what if so-and-so's children don't speak Welsh or what if, you know... Who will be here in 10, 100 years' time? And will we speak Welsh? What will Wales look like? And they're questions we do ask day to day. They're quite realist questions. They're normal questions. Yes. And science fiction is a playing ground, maybe, to perhaps think, well, this is my answer. And it does lend itself quite yeah, naturally to that. Do you find it frustrating, though, that, that, that we need to have that kind of platform to talk about Welshness and and language and survival as a, as a as a Welsh speaking nation, and not be able to just enjoy good stories through the medium of Welsh, based <laughs> on another planet or on a spaceship or whatever, the element of entertainment somehow. I mean, what if Star Trek is anything? There are lots of life lessons in Star yeah. Trek, but it's also entertainment, isn't it? Yeah, true. And I suppose people will see what out of get out of it what 
they want as well. I know Star Trek for me, I look at and they compare with the with the Cold War and I see those themes and I'm like, oh, look, Spock is, you know, sharing his communist ideals about everyone being happy. And Captain Kirk is there going, no, we must have a hierarchy. <laughs> um, but I see that in it, even though I can also enjoy it as a story. Um, and well, there are many instances in Welsh. I think a Blanid Dirion is more of an adventure. And perhaps some people will always say, well, you should leave light literature or, you know, popular literature alone let people enjoy it and yeah but, but we... even Jean Roddenberry himself who was the creator of Star Trek was trying to portray a different world wasn't he he was yeah. like like he tried to persuade the broadcaster for the first officer to be a woman and the broadcaster said nah not ready for yeah. women in America <laughs> at, at the moment and on the bridge but when he sort of said oh the first officer is a green man with pointed ears then all of a sudden that was oh, that was more acceptable than a black person or a woman what's quite terrifying <laughs> is that's still part of our discourse today when I think of Doctor Who and having Jodie Whittaker yeah. as the first female doctor yeah. And there was also a remake of um, all-female Ghostbusters. And people were furious. Mm. But they are such relevant questions for today and how we perhaps see each other. I think even though there's a new... Well, there was in the 1970s a new wave of feminist um, science fiction globally, mm. you know, there are so much, many questions to ask about <laughs> feminism and science fiction and how we perhaps... Also how we see science fiction. And I think a minority language perspective is really important in yeah. that. And, well, minorities in general. Because, yeah. I mean, Michelle Nichols, who became the sort of, you know, Lieutenant Uhura, who was the black woman on the bridge, she became a woman who was choosing astronauts for NASA. You know, so that is kind of... It, it's it's science fiction really moving the boundaries and trying to trying to push forward and change people's Gosh, yeah. ideas. And that idea of that new frontier being a diverse frontier. Yes. And that's really important. Yeah. It's fascinating. And but when you think of okay, that you know, the topic that we're supposed to be talking about is is looking at how you know, exploring global issues, right? And d d what place do you think there is uh, now and what kind of issues do you think that that science fiction and literature could help with? I think obviously a huge issue now and maybe something that's often talked about is climate change and science fiction can imagine that world before it's happened and perhaps try, if not warning people, at least consider or prompt questions about what is our responsibility? What should we do to stop the perhaps, you know, that apocalyptic future happening. And in Welsh language science fiction, A Dour by Lloyd-Jones, which is also translated to Water, and Lleiki Roberts' um, trilogy, the Ennis trilogy, definitely discusses that. And, you know, although, yeah, we've perhaps seen, or oh, the apocalypse has sort of benefits for some communities that prefer to be more insular, actually, we've got a global responsibility. And even with Welsh language science fiction appearing to be quite niche, it's got an important voice as part of that discussion. You know, what can, can what do authors think that we can contribute as readers? What do they want to prompt us to contribute? So do you think that there are any coming on the horizon doing that? Are there any writers? Thicky, you mentioned there. Thicky Robert, yeah. yeah. She's written um, the Ennis trilogy and before that, Anne Smottenbach, um, which is Dear Little Spot, um, which is about a mum and a growing baby in her womb, who she, whom she writes to. And it's quite interesting in Welsh. There's a lot of diary novels, um, of diaries written in the future. And something I often have to consider when I look at science fiction is, OK, so I'm looking in the present at the future that was written in the past, and sometimes that future is now in the past. So that, I, that sort of relationship with time that we often have with diaries as a sort of source of information... But yeah, that Lear Titus is a quite a prominent person who's a big science fiction reader and an author now as well. Um, and it's quite interesting now to see more fantasy novels for younger people as well. I know Alan Davis and um, Elida Jones. So there's much more sort of scope now to really discuss sort of these issues and perhaps lead the way for more authors to sort of contribute this voice. And again, it being such a normal conversation, you know, normal dinner you know, things that we discuss. We discuss the technology around us. We discuss what we do tomorrow. Yeah. It's funny, maybe that science fiction, people have a stigma or sort of this really clear image of, oh no, you know, that's not relevant. When actually, it really is. Yeah. Oh, how about you? Um, you've ever thought of 
I mean, your your interest in science fiction and your knowledge and understanding of the stuff that you're doing for your PhD is really infectious. But does it not make you want to be the the right the next writer of science fiction and well? It's quite interesting. I'm an avid reader anyway. And if anyone asks what my hobbies are, I am quite boring. I like reading and writing. Um, nothing quite active or nothing like or exciting or anything like that. But I tend to when I come ho- go home and down tools, I tend to read anything that's completely different as well. Because for me, and especially with a Welsh language context, it's got to exist in a wider corpus of literature as well. So I will read a bit of anything. But writing wise, I've only gone into science fiction, I think, once or twice. And I imagined an Eisteddfod, so the Welsh cultural, uh, Welsh language um, festival of culture um, happening online. And funnily enough, through COVID, it Oh, and when did online. you write that? And I wrote it, I think 2014, wow. 13. That's quite prophetic, so wasn't it? I was quite proud of that. But <laughs> um, again, it said more about the time I wrote it than it, you know, it wasn't meant to be a prophecy. But yeah, it was quite interesting it to see was. that was suddenly a reality. Yeah. Um, and it is interesting looking back at older science fiction with Nelson Henry V. We've we've discussed and that image of the National Theatre of Wales, which obviously now exists, both Theatre Genedley for Cymru. And National Theatre of Wales. And do you think that it exists because of the work that Islin Folk Ellis wrote then in With Nos and Henry Veed? Whether it exists because, I don't know, but it possibly did influence well, and I, it I helped think, imagine it. Yeah. yeah, I do think that helping to imagine and, and putting it out oh. there, be that in a book or in a TV programme like Star Trek, which has influenced a lot of scientific technology, you know, I, th- I think it's, it's quite valid and important. Oh, definitely. So... Um, just to end then, your your journey from Aberystwyth and now to Swansea. So where, what stage are you at with your research and, and how are you finding life in Swansea University and, and what support are you getting and who are you working with? I have had such a warm welcome here in Swansea University and it's been a lovely family to join. I, I sort of accidentally had a career break from academia, not quite through choice, but... Um, it was quite exciting. I got to try different things. I'm lucky with my degree in Welsh that I got those opportunities. I worked briefly with um, the Welsh language uh, news service BBC Cymru Vau for a bit. And I also worked with a local authority um, as a translator. But next, um, I definitely, the, the next step is to publish a volume, hopefully um, a book based on my research, science, Welsh language science fiction, because there isn't anything no one has done that before so it's oh, quite I, exciting it is exciting and it's things that people need to know and um yeah i'm also part of the narrating um rural change network here in the university and um it's quite interesting even though i'm from a farming background i never really thought and at the beginning of this podcast i said oh you know i was trying to escape those roots i was trying to escape that rural sort of community that i often felt stuck in but now i i met obviously older and hopefully wiser sort of embraced that a lot more and being part of that network made me think well actually the development in farming over the decades what my grandfather saw my father saw and what was still seeing his tractor's more like a spaceship than uh, we see in the original Star Trek what, the series. the Starship Enterprise? No, it's almost it's got buttons and lights and I couldn't drive it but you know that you know, <laughs> I've lost my train of thought now. Um, <laughs> that relationship between technology and farming and science fiction and imagining what farming's like. And we're often in, in Wales obsessed with the names of our fields and, you know, oh, they can't change. They've no, got we to go stay back, the same. don't we? we want to change. Yeah, but we want to stay actually, the same. What? how can we imagine, you know, sustainable farming, mm-hmm. um, developments in farming? What? What can we imagine? But yeah, that's something that's... On, uh, on the go at the moment. Well, I think you have a great future uh, in front of you, um, Miriam Diochlawr. So many thanks to Dr. Miriam Ellen Jones. If you want to know more about Miriam's research and maybe pick up a couple of those books, do look her up on the staff profile on Swansea University website. And for more information about research in general at Swansea University, then do visit swansea.ac.uk forward slash research. And that's it for today. Um, Thanks so much for listening. And thanks to my guest, Dr. Miriam Ellen Jones. My name is Aileen Rees and this was Exploring Global Problems from Swansea University.